So what do we do when exercises are stalling? Welcome back to Hypertrophy Academy. Mike is out of the way so you can see the new shirts. First drop, very excited, gonna revise the logo, design, maybe put some out soon, but let's not waste any more time. What do we do when progress stalls and we cannot add load or reps to an exercise? All of you at one point are going to run into this issue. At a certain point, Progress will slow down and maybe that's because we're doing something wrong or it's just because our training age has increased and the rate of muscle growth has naturally and inherently slowed down. So before we jump into what I look at when dealing with a client in terms of you know, changing things and that sort of thing, we need to actually set reasonable expectations. So if you're a newer lifter, you can realistically progress things a couple of times a month, more likely than that, almost every week. So I say a couple and that's pretty, that's pretty slow. For a beginner, I would say three or four times a month, so once a week almost, you'd be looking to progress things. Now, that's not to say that a beginner has to progress every single week. You do need to zoom out a little bit. We do have to view this from a month to month basis, not a week to week basis, because realistically, week to week is far too soon and too quick to see any real change. And of course, if we start overreacting when one week passes, passes without progress, we're gonna change things preemptively, right? We're gonna overreact, we're going to act too soon, and we'll just slow ourselves down from overthinking. So we always gotta zoom out a little bit. Beginners, should progress almost every week, but at least a couple of times a month. For an intermediate lifter, you'd be looking to PR. Depending on the movement and your experience, you know, what we define as intermediate, you'd be looking to PR a couple of times a month, maybe at most. So, you know, I'm saying like once or twice a month, you could hit an all time PR on, say, uh, a hack squat, an incline press, bicep curl, whatever. And then for an advanced lifter, it's hard to say, but you know, it's not unreasonable for something like a leg press to progress like once a month, maybe every six weeks. Like if you're proper advanced and strong, hitting an all-time PR on a movement like leg press, that that's a big ask, right? That's not to say the other sets weren't causing growth. It's just the magnitude of the growth. Now, obviously. For example, you can add two and a half kilos to leg press, you know, every week and you won't really notice it. Um, but adding an entire rep or beating your all time PR from when you were bulking, when you were heavier or when the program was different, like th there's a lot of different ways to look at it. But basically, you know, we should set reasonable expectations. If you're a beginner, you should be progressing like all the time. If you're an intermediate lifter, you should be progressing most of the time. If you're advanced, you should be progressing sometimes. Um, people will often throw around like things like, if you're not progressing every week, your program sucks. This is just marketing, right? These people, I don't know. I don't think it's a good way of marketing, but apparently it works. But you shouldn't, it's not reasonable to expect that you will progress every single week because muscle growth is slow. So based on those expectations we have set, and you might have your own expectations, maybe you're enhanced, maybe you're, a beginner who's enhanced, maybe you're an elite natural, like we're all gonna have different expectations and ideas about progression. But now that we've set those, we go through sort of a checklist of sorts. So the very first thing we look at is, are we moving well? Are we doing the exercise properly? Obviously, if we have worse form, the rate of muscle growth will be slower and the rate of progress will also subsequently be slower. So are we doing things properly? Are we controlling the eccentric? Are we controlling the change of direction? Or are we sort of letting the weight free fall? Are we bouncing out of the stretch position using momentum and inertia to carry us through the movement? Remember, if you use momentum and inertia out of the stretch position, which is gonna be more connective tissue, et cetera, that will carry you through the concentric. It's not just like that portion of the movement uh, has a reduction in intramuscular force. Inertia will carry. So you might use a lot of momentum out of the bottom going, oh, well, I don't really care if the bottom, you know, it doesn't get a lot of stimulus because I'm trying to grow my quads and there's a lot of glutes active in the bottom. It's like that logic is sound, 
if inertia didn't exist. And so that momentum that you use out of the bottom will affect the mid range where the quads are supposed to be working the hardest, right? So are we actually controlling things? Is the change of direction controlled? Is it standardized? And then you got to look at things like, are there joint actions occurring that we don't need in said movement? So an example I always use, is there upper back rounding occurring in our rowing? Do we need upper back rounding or do we just need protraction? Can we differentiate between those two things? Is there a lot of anterior tilt of the scap and throwing our head forward in a press? Do we need those things? Should they be happening? Probably not. So looking at control, change of direction, the general um, sort of quality of the movement, and that might take up two or three weeks worth of changes. You might just work on that for a few weeks, then go back to the top of the list. So if we have seen a problem, we're not progressing, we check technique for a couple of weeks, we dial it in, we improve it, we go back to the top of the list and it's still not working, we then move on to the second thing. And in my opinion, the second thing is going to be Nutrition, sleep, stress, externals. Now, I know that's a hot take because it's like sleep doesn't matter. Nutrient doesn't, I mean, it does. It does matter, right? So if I've assessed technique and I think everything is good enough, I'm always going to go, okay, maybe we're not sleeping well. Maybe we're not eating well. If there's a number of things going wrong, there's a few movements that aren't progressing, maybe it's that. If there's one movement that's not progressing, maybe it's not that, right? So I think that framing is quite useful, but I'm always gonna ask anyway. Then maybe assess the exercise order. So is this movement first? Is it in the first half of the session? Or is it, is it in the second half of the session? Now, if it's in the second half of the session, definitely move it earlier and just see if that helps. Now, if that helps, then you have some sort of issue going on during the session, there's too many sets or you need to swap the order just to give that more attention or something like that. If it's in the first half of the session, that's where I'm less inclined to move things because realistically it shouldn't have too much of an impact in the first couple of exercises, but you could still do that. Now, if that doesn't work, and you can do these in different orders, by the way, this is just like my thought process. If that doesn't work, we can then look at taking an extra rest day prior, so pushing that session back a day, or taking a set away from the previous workout. So let's say, for example, we're doing six sets of pecs a week, couple presses, couple flies. We do it Monday, Thursday, so three on Monday, three on Thursday. If Monday's pec deck or whatever isn't progressing, take away a set from Thursday, and see if that helps. If that helps, you weren't recovering, you were doing too much, right? If the rest day thing helps by pushing it back, adding a rest day prior, you also were not recovering. Now, I think that taking a set away is easier because it requires less work. Changing your training days requires more work, so it's more annoying to do. So I would start by taking a set away or and or actually, and or pushing it back. The issue with doing two things at once is that you don't know what the solution is. So that's why I recommend picking one, whichever you think is easier or whichever you'd prefer and doing that one alone, not both at the same time. And that kind of goes for everything here. If we change two variables, how do we know which one it was? Let alone three variables, right? So for all of these, I would do like one at absolute most two at the same time. For these two, adding, uh, taking away a set or moving the days, pick one, right? If that helps, you weren't recovering, decrease the um, amount of sets. You could also look at decreasing the stretch that you're getting because obviously that's going to delay the recovery. Um, I would just look at, um, I would look at the amount of sets first. You'll know if someone's overstretching if you have a good understanding of how we should do movements. And I've done some stuff on exercise execution, so check it out. Um, but if those two things don't help, then we have an issue. By that time, we've looked at exercise, 
execution, how we're doing things. We've also weighted a little bit based on what we would expect to be reasonable for the person's experience level. We've also checked our external variables. We've looked at sleep, stress, calories, protein, carbs, fats, meal timing, etc. I would always ask the person how their warm-ups look. Now, this is something that you should do at the start. So I should have, I should have already mentioned this, but what do our warm-ups look like? Are we doing three sets of 10 with 30% and then jumping into our top set? Or are we doing a set of eight at 85% then our top set? Because both of those things are gonna be um, detrimental. So I would do like a few reps at 50%, a few reps at 70%, and a couple of reps at 90 or 92, maybe even 95% of your top set, then jumping into that top set. Now, warm-ups, like I said, should have been mentioned first. I forgot. Those are very important. So that question should be asked at the very beginning. For most people who warm up properly, it's not going to be an, a big problem. Uh, and that is rarely an issue for the people I work with, but it could be for the people that you work with or for yourself if you are maybe less experienced. You've also checked the exercise order as well as pushing the session back or taking it set out from the previous workout and you've also potentially looked at reducing the amount of stretch you're getting. For example, I had a client who couldn't progress his dips. We reduced the range of motion and of course that makes it like technically easier because there's less range, but the decrease in stretch just significantly sped up the progress because we had better recovery. Uh, and then pecs and triceps started progressing faster, right? So logical. But at that point, you've done the, the basics. You, you've, you've ticked everything off, right? Of course, I'd love to be more specific about this stuff, but without looking at the person, the exercise, and the program, I, I can't be more specific. This is where if we've done all those things, we've given it time, and we're sure that there's nothing else going on, that is where I'd add volume. Now, I have to add a caveat to that because if you're doing 10 plus sets, adding volume is not the solution, right? I'm talking about the more science-based approach under 10 sets where maybe adding a set is a solution. So um, let's say faster recovering muscles, glutes, quads, calves. If you're doing less than five sets, definitely add a set, right? Definitely. So let's say we're doing upper lower and we've only got five sets of quads, definitely go to six, right? Give it some time, if nothing, maybe try a seventh, but I've personally never got there. I've never had that happen because my programs are good. So I don't know what the solution is after try adding a bit more volume and I'd have to think about it. But adding a second set has never happened to me. So I honestly can't tell you if that's a good idea or not. Doesn't sound like a good idea unless you're doing ultra low volume and then adding two sets might be reasonable. But if you're around that like five set mark, I don't know if adding two sets will help. You could even look at exercise selection, et cetera. Um, but nonetheless, if you're gonna add volume, make sure that you add one set at a time at most. And just ask yourself, is this a muscle that like realistically is gonna need more volume? If you're doing four or five sets of pecs a week, I don't think it's gonna need more volume. But if we said quads, I'd say definitely. If you said calves, definitely. If you're like Declan, I'm doing five sets of biceps a week. I would be very hesitant to add a sixth one, right? Um, of course, this depends on the person and the training age, et cetera. If we're a beginner, yeah, we spend most of our time between like five and 10 sets. If we are, you know, intermediate or intermediate advanced or advanced, we're spending most of our time between three and seven sets. If we're super advanced, maybe anywhere between like two and seven sets, six sets maybe. Um, but you you can add volume. It's just, uh, you know, I can't be too specific about how you go about doing it because, you know, I'm not talking about a specific exercise, muscle group or person. But l basically the point here with the volume stuff is that it's it's a last resort. So we don't jump the gun on adding volume. If you add a set and nothing happens in a couple of weeks, start again, start the process again. I, I just don't think unless you're doing five, less than five sets that a second set is going to be any better than just the first set you added. Um, but yeah, at this point, if something's still not going right, book a consult with me. 
with another coach because maybe there's something missing. And because we have written good programs for so long and all my friends are good coaches, I actually don't see that many bad programs. So it's hard to say what is going wrong. Now, as I've said that, something has come to mind. If you're doing drop sets, supersets, any of that stuff, intensifiers, that is your that should be priority number one. Stop doing that shit, right? But I'm assuming you're watching this page, you're not doing that stuff. But that would be actually something that people do. So you would want to stop doing that as soon as possible. And like I said, if all that has not worked, make sure you're viewing it from the right time frame. What rate of progress would we expect? Am I being reasonable or unreasonable for what I can expect? Now, if we're cutting, you would really have to readjust your, um, your expectations. You know, movements like pressing and very isolated things like bicep curls, tricep pushdowns, they are going to progress slower. First reason, less energy. Second reason, less fat and um, less intramuscular carbs, which is most important which means less internal moment, which means we are, by definition, physics weaker. So we will see less progress on a cut, but we can still progress on a cut, of course, because muscle growth, fat loss, independent process can be done at the same time. Just again, need to adjust your expectations. For example, I would expect to hit one, maybe two at most incline press PRs during my cut. If I was leaner than I am currently and further into my cut, I'd be fingers crossed praying for one a month. And I would consider myself like intermediate advanced and like decently lean, like 13, 14%, right? So adjust your expectations based on the person, based on what's happening with nutrition. Go through that list. If it doesn't work, go through it again. If it doesn't work on the third, on the second try, consult someone, pay for a coach, to give you their opinion because you've likely missed something. In this situation, most people just throw volume at the wall. Hopefully, this has been a helpful sort of thought process for us to walk through. If you've done all this and you're still having trouble, send me a DM. I can't answer everyone, but I try. And if you're really motivated, consider checking out the Hypertrophy Academy education or even better, fix all your issues with a Hypertrophy Academy program. They're like 26 USD. You can find them on the Hypertrophy Academy Instagram. They're awesome programs. We have over 500 sold. People come back for more. People tell their friends because they're awesome programs. We do the right thing. We understand why we do it and we train hard. Hopefully this was helpful. Thank you very much for watching. Hypertrophy Academy merch coming in future with a better design than this. See you next time.